Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Cody Firearms Museum, part of the Buffalo Bill Center for the West, up in gorgeous Cody, Wyoming. We're taking a look today at one of the guns out of their extensive gun collection. This is a Winchester prototype rifle. Uh, Winchester designated this the M2, with the a little bit of hubris, and the idea that this would supplant and replace the M1 Garand. Now, to place this properly in history, um, this came after the Winchester G30M rifle. Now, the G30M started as a project by Ed Browning, who was the half-brother of John Moses Browning. He developed a rifle uh, that he submitted to the Ordnance Department in 1938. He then sold it to Winchester. He then, unfortunately, died. Winchester made some adjustments, the most substantial one being they replaced his somewhat odd gas system with a tappet gas system developed by David Marshall Carbine Williams. Uh, convicted bootlegger who went to work for Winchester as a firearms designer. Talented guy, a little erratic apparently, but the, the G30M rifle had a tilting bolt and it had this Williams Tappet gas system and it was tested by the Marine Corps <coughs> in late 1940. In fact, we have a full video on the G30M, which you can check out if you haven't seen it before. That would be worth doing. After the, the result of that test was that the Marine Corps adopted the M1 Garand. Now, they had been testing the M1. They had uh, a 1903 Springfield in the test as a control sample, because that's what they had been using at the time. And they were also looking at the Winchester G30, or G30M, and also the Johnson rifle. And ultimately, the Winchester came in fourth out of four, which was kind of disappointing. It had potential. Um, by the end of this very extensive Marine Corps test, however, it had about twice as many malfunctions and about twice as many broken parts as the M1. Uh, so was rejected. Now, Winchester's response to this, they didn't lose heart. They still thought there was a, a good opportunity uh, for the gun, and they wanted to have a self-loading military rifle that they owned the rights to, to sell potentially to the U.S. military or potentially to other militaries. Uh, the Canadian government was interested in this project at times. Uh, so they went back to the drawing board. They, they took the G30M back to Carbine Williams, and they said, let's see if we can work out a new model that gets rid of some of the problems that we had uh, in that Marine Corps test. And what Williams did was he basically took the tilting bolt system, which was the last major element in this rifle from Ed Browning, chucked it out and replaced it with a bolt almost identical to the M1 Garand, a two lug rotating bolt. In fact, this particular rifle is like the, the one first Winchester tool room scrabbled together example, just as a proof of concept. And in fact, most of the, the three major parts, the opera, the receiver, and the bolt, all appear to have been actually made from M1 Garand forgings. So they adapted them to this new and slightly different system, but they didn't even make parts completely from scratch. They took, you know, forged M1 blanks and used those. So this was going to be their solution, that they figured a lot of these problems had been coming from the tilting bolt system, replace that with Garand's version, leave the, the tappet gas system, which they thought was superior, and in objectively probably was superior to the, a long stroke gas piston, and in the process, they were able to cut about two pounds off of this gun compared to the M1. So uh, internally, they actually referred to this as the seven and a half pound gun, because it is, and it's actually a remarkably lightweight and easy handling gun. Now, Winchester wasn't necessarily planning on sending this right off to the Army. Obviously, this particular rifle, which is the one of them, um, was still really in the early stages. It wasn't ready for test firing in any formal way. But in July of 1941, a guy named Rene Studler, who was the chief of the Ordnance Department and an instrumental figure in a lot of the arms development of this era, and a really smart guy himself, he happened to be visiting Winchester, and they showed this to him. Uh, you know, get his ideas, let them know, hey, you know, we're working on this thing, keep it in mind, might be interesting. And he took a look at it, and his reaction was something that really surprised the guys at Winchester. He wasn't really interested in this as a, as a 30 not 6 rifle, because they had the Garand, they weren't going to get rid of the Garand. But, they had been running uh, trials for the light rifle program, which would eventually develop into the M1 carbine. And Winchester had been deliberately ignoring this, this uh, program because it was just one thing too many. They had too many other projects going on. They didn't have the R&D money to also get involved in that. Well, Studler came in and looked at this rifle and said, you know, this is pretty lightweight already. If you shrink this down to 30 carbine, make a version in the 30 carbine cartridge, uh, probably wouldn't be hard to meet the five pound weight requirement for the light rifle program and 
this is this rifle looks like it has an awful lot of potential. Uh, Winchester was a little taken aback by this and went pretty much went well. Um, okay, I guess we can do that. And they kind of slapped together um, in a very short time period a version of this rifle in 30 carbine. So what that gave them was the 30 carbine cartridge, a Garin style two lug rotating bolt, and a carbine Williams gas tappet operating system. Which sounds an awful lot like an M1 carbine, doesn't it? Well, it was in fact submitted to the second round of M1 carbine trials. It won, and it was developed into the M1 carbine. So this is the rifle that was shown to Stoodler and prompted him to suggest that Winchester get involved in this as a basis for the M1 carbine, which it did. That was the one really successful Winchester product that came from Carbine Williams, and it's where he gets his nickname, which he has to this day. Uh, his d involvement in that program has been a little bit overstated, mostly because of Hollywood, uh, but he was an instrumental part of that program, and he was apparently as interesting and maybe volatile of a figure as, as he is often made out to be. Anyway, let's take a closer look at this. I'll pull the handguard off so we can see the actual gas system inside, because it's pretty cool. So this is a pretty svelte little rifle, although of course that's helped by the fact that it doesn't have a rear sight. Um, for the purposes of this gun, there's really no need to put a rear sight on it. This was just a, a function testing sort of tool room prototype. Now, you can see here this bolt is just like an M1. It works like an M1. It has a modified BAR magazine, which we can pull out here. Should be. So here's our modified magazine. I believe this is a five rounder. Uh, these guns were typically tested, well the G30 had been tested with 5, 10, and 20 round magazines. Um, this I'm sure is just kind of a, a stand-in uh, for the, the short term, but it's a modified, I believe it's a modified BAR magazine. A lot of these guns uh, use that sort of mag. Like the G30, the magazine release on this is located here on the front of the trigger guard. The safety would be in this hole, but there is no safety on this particular rifle. Um, if this had gone into development, in fact, when it did later go into development, and we'll get to that story separately, uh, it would have a safety. Like I mentioned earlier, the bolt, the op rod, and the receiver all appear to have been made from uh, M1 Garand forgings. Now let's go ahead and take the handguard off. I'm going to use my universal disassembly tool here. Uh, just like the previous iteration of this rifle, the front is held on by a captive pin rather than a screw, which is nice. You can pull that out there. And then the front block slides off like that. And then the rear band slides forward. This doesn't have a retaining catch. It's just snug in place. There we go. And then the upper handguard comes off. So this is very much like an M1 carbine gas system, obviously. There's a recoil spring right down here. You can see that's running in a tube right along here. And I can pull this back. And right up there, right, right there, you can see the tappet gas piston that has been added onto the bottom of the barrel. It's interesting to note that there are these two rails on the side of the barrel, which have been apparently welded on. Um, this is not a, this kind of welding is something that was done for prototype like very early prototype guns like this, but not uh, firing models generally. Part of the weight reduction comes from the fact that all of the clip feeding elements have been taken out here. Part of the weight reduction comes from the fact that you don't have a full length piston under the barrel. Once we get past this point, there's nothing under the barrel, it's just open. Uh, because this is a short stroke piston. I should say, the way this tappet system works, what, what Marshall Williams, David Marshall Williams came up with, was a gas piston that only moves about a tenth of an inch, so two or three millimeters. It has this very short travel, and in that travel it gives a good whack to this operating rod, uh, and then the op rod just travels backward under inertia after that initial push. Uh, now, ultimately, this rifle, when, when the M1 carbine project really took off for Winchester, this rifle was shelved. They're, they're really, you know, nobody was particularly interested in it at the time. The U.S. government wasn't going to do it. At that point, Winchester was now making M1 Garands for the military on contract, and they were also starting to do M1 carbines. They had enough on their plate. Uh, however, a little bit later, the 
this project would come back and it would uh, come back and be further developed under the name of the G30R. So we'll have a follow-up video, a further video on the G30R coming up a little bit later. So make sure to stay tuned and uh, check in for that one. Well, thank you for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. It's been a lot of fun going through step by step the development here of uh, Ed Browning and David Marshall Williams contributions and experimental rifles with the Winchester Company. No. Of course, I'd like to thank the Cody Firearms Museum for let me, letting me take a look at this gun, take it partially apart to show you guys. If you're ever in the Cody area, I really can't encourage you strongly enough to stop in and check out the Firearms Museum. They have an extensive and very impressive collection. And if you like this sort of content online, please consider checking out my Patreon page and account. It is funding at a buck a month from folks like you that makes it possible for me to travel to places like Cody, Wyoming and bring you guys guns like this. Thanks for watching.